The most influential book on sleight of hand with cards is written by a man who is anonymous. If ever there was a more poetic mystery in magic, you, you could not create one better than that. What is The Expert at the Card Table? Well, The Expert at the Card Table is a book, uh, first and foremost, um, written in 1902 by S.W. Erdnase, whoever that was. The question as to who wrote this book is the great mystery of magic of the 20th century. It's like our version of the Kennedy assassination, who shot the president. It's kind of like when a kid talks about Santa Claus. Maybe he's real, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. It's a cool, it's the Santa Claus of magic. You know, every kid wants to know, you know, is Santa Claus real, right? And when they know, as desperate as they were, Christmas isn't quite as much fun anymore. So for me, I want to keep things fun. And I like the fact that this guy has concealed his identity. And for over a hundred years, people have wondered who he was. What makes Erdnay so interesting is that, yes, there were gambling books before him. And there are some that have some very similar language that he's, you know, cribbed from. But it's the first book that really describes in absolute technical detail how to execute these slights. But one of the reasons this is such a great book is because it really set the modern template for magic books, card magic books. Erdnays was a game changer, you know, compared to the books that bef came before it. Certain moves in the book I use regularly, but that's not the important part of that book, at least not for me. It's uh, the uniformity of action um, that Erdnays discusses in that book, and I think that's why that, that book is important today anyway. What Erdnays did is that it taught the hands to work together. And there are very few, if any, magic books or gambling books that actually do that in that way. It's spawned a lot of people who have studied it and um, therefore, you know, it's become like the Bible of card conjuring. Professor, it was around that time that a, a momentous event happened in your life, which <clears throat> all the rest of us that have been interested in magic over the years have been a, benefited from as well, because you read a certain book, I think, that oh, influenced yes, the your magical life. Oh, yes, the card table, Erdnays, yes, Erdnays, the expert at the card table. So Di Vernon is the most influential sleight-of-hand magician of the 20th century. And this is not simply because of longevity. He did live a very long life and knew all the great magicians you could name or even not name in the 20th century, but because he brought a new vision to magic. He brought the notion of naturalness to sleight of hand, and he also brought a kind of thinking, a close analysis to the construction of magical effects, to the methods of magic, a level of analysis that really had not previously been applied. Uh, Di Vernon is uh, maybe the most important figure in, in modern times as far as magic is concerned. You know, before him it was uh, Robert Houdin, Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, um, who also by accident got a magic book and <laughs> ended up changing magic as we know it. And, you know, every once in a while somebody comes along in any field, you know, the Michael Jordan of basketball, somebody comes along who's just so far advanced and, and thinking about it differently, and that's what Vernon was. And Vernon changed the way that magicians were doing magic. There is not a magician alive today, whether he or she knows it or not, that hasn't been influenced by the changes that Di Vernon brought to 20th century magic. Gamblers had to do things uh, differently. They have to be very natural when, when you're working at a card table. If you, if you, uh, you know, magicians would always do these weird moves and do a pass and they're going to move, uh, you know, in a strange way to get those cards to switch places. And you can't do that at a card table. And that's what Vernon took from the book and brought to the magic world. Put the right. palm that card, hit with your thumb, and do it all in one action. That's it, see, but, but do it a little faster. Do it, push it. Say, well, let me, spread, let me see what you got. You reach yeah. out, you see. Yeah, that's it. You see what I mean? Yeah, and there's, no, there's no, way, that no the, way to check. It's all yeah. over. Everything is to look natural. There are no 
fast or, or unnatural looking movements that can be suspected. If an audience suspects that you did something when your hands moved quickly, <clears throat> they're pretty happy that they figured the trick out. Oh, he did something there. And that was unacceptable to Burnett. He didn't want any of that. He wanted them to be able to watch this trick three times and be completely clueless and say, it's impossible. It's just plain magic. Brings naturalness to magic and thinks rather than setting off the audience's alarms, putting them on notice, if you will, with an unnatural action, holding a coin between two fingers or something like this, what if the actions were so natural that the audience would never suspect, let alone detect, that anything secret was going on? And this transformed magic. And it was Erdnays that led him to that insight. When I think about the route that brought me to this particular book, I have to admit that Di Vernon, the professor, is one of the main reasons I've read this book. He certainly inspired other magicians and people of his own generation and people of the next generation to take the book seriously and never to dismiss it. His name will never go away in magic, like Houdini's name will never go away, and I think David Copperfield's name will never go away. The close-up magicians, uh, the name Di Vernon will never go away, uh, from Canada like me, so you know he's a good guy. As I read Vernon, I realized that he was Erdnace's biggest champion. He was the, our cheerleader for this book for 90-something years. And it's pretty clear that we would not appreciate this book in the magic community to the extent that we appreciate it without Vernon. I think Di Vernon's the, the first guy that said, this is a really important book, The Expert. This is, this is so important that I carry this thing in my back pocket, or at least he did as a young man. Vernon is the guy that people reference. You know, if you go to the castle, he still has a chair. You know, uh, Vernon was the one to say, here's what it could be, and here's what I'm going to do with it, and I think you can do more, but you're not working hard enough. That the guys that, that passed his audition, so to speak, um, he changed their lives. Many, many guys came to Los Angeles specifically because they knew Vernon was sitting in that corner every night, and they went up there basically to graduate school. You know, they had their, they'd put in many years of practice, and they knew the basics, and they wanted to be schooled by the master. And Vernon was the guy and uh, was happy to do that. He was really cosmopolitan in the sense that he could talk to any kind of person instantly. Um, charming, effortlessly charming and aware, self-aware of it. Uh, acerbically funny, uh, fearlessly so. Uh, quick to laugh, um, strongly opinionated. That, you know, it never failed uh, to be present. Oh, Di Vernon was the original bad boy. The original bad boy. He's the guy that told people they sucked to their faces. You know, he used to do tests. He'd, he'd say there's a certain number of mistakes in the book, and he would test people on that. I, I've heard stories like he would do, you know, tests for people, and then the guys in the know, they'd be like, well, how's your diagonal palm shift? And start using moves from Erdnays to test the other magicians. And... He was a grumpy old man because he was so passionate about magic. He wanted you, he wanted you to perform magic well which there, there is not a lot of people that do that now, uh, vocally. There's not enough magicians that are checking other magicians, I, I don't think. He didn't just read it, he studied every page of this. And the, the great stories of, of a young Percy Diaconis as a teenager traveling around with Vernon and Vernon quizzing him on various moves and various things in the book to make sure that, that he knew this book like, like the Bible, which to those guys, it really was. Di Vernon was, well, he is the professor. He's this uh, lauded guy. He was born in 1894, and uh, he got Erdnays very young. Erdnays came out in 1902, and it seems like, according to the stories, that he got it when it was first coming out. I don't know how true that is or uh, all the details, but he definitely had it early on. No, you see, my father was, was he, the head of the copyright and trademark branch of the Canadian government, the Department of Agriculture, and one night at dinner, he came, when we were having dinner at night, he said, you know, David, he said, a book came in to be copyrighted the other day. 
He said, you might be interested in it. It has a lot of tricks in the back. But he said, I can't let you read it because it's all about gambling. And I said, Dad, I, I, I'd love to read it anyway. He said, oh, he says, you're far too young. He says, you're, you're too young. And I said, no, Dad, I'm not too young. I was only a young boy. I was 11 years old. He said, no. He said, it tells about crooked gambling. And I said, well, Dad, please, won't you let, bring it home and let me read it? And he said, no, not until you're older. So I was quite disappointed. But a few days later, I walked up along Bank Street in Ottawa, and in a, in a stationery store in the window, I saw this book that he mentioned, because he told me the title, The Expert at the Card Table. Things were different then. You didn't have a YouTube to get on and, and you know, get all these different secrets and, and things. So he spent time with that book, <laughs> clearly, and he, he learned everything in it. I bet he would practice for hours and weeks before he would perform a trick, even for one of his friends. And some guys nowadays, I think, will learn something and do it within a day. <laughs> well, I learned that. He said, yeah. he said, there's only one thing. It's the extreme and it takes hours of assiduous practice. Mm -hmm. And this pleased me. I thought, well, I, I love to practice. So I said in one of my books, I think, and it's very true, I said, if practice is irksome, if you don't like to practice, for God's sake, take up some other hobby. I mean, people yeah. who play piano, they love to, they don't, it's not irksome, they love to practice because they're getting better and better all the time. They enjoy it. He was, a, he was a student of magic for over 90 years, which is astonishing. And I think when Vernon was young, people did pocket tricks. And he's the guy that said, th th these aren't pocket tricks. This is magic done close up right under people's noses. I took my bicycle and I bought Erdnays and I practically lived with that from the time I was 11. and. I just lived with that book. I took it to school with me. I even took it to church one time. The right guy got that book, um, and he digested it, and he, he brought it to the magic world, and it changed the way that we look at magic and changed the way we do things. You mentioned now, Professor, you've been mentioning Erdnays, quoting Erdnays at length, and you feel that the, the, the finest, study of Erdnays... The Erdnays's... finest book on cards ever written, without a doubt. I mean, there's no, no nothing that compares it even remotely to Erdnays. No. He wasn't the only person that liked this book. In fact, he wasn't the first person that liked this book. When The Expert at the Card Table came out in 1902, Vernon was only eight years old. And he probably hadn't discovered this book yet, or if he had, he didn't understand it yet. And other people were writing good things about the book very early on in uh, magazines like The Sphinx and things of that nature. So other magicians noticed it, but they sort of noticed it, thought it was a good book, and then never mentioned it again, really. And what Vernon did was he came along, thought it was the book, and mentioned it in every conversation for the next 90 years. I mean, the book was published in 1902, and even though a few people mentioned the book, notably T. Nelson Downs and The Art of Magic uh, in like 1909 or so, and then uh, Professor Hoffman, Angela Lewis in around 1912, you know, there was some sporadic other mentions, but it didn't really catch on. I mean, Downs just said, uh, you should learn a gambling trick. Erdnays is, a, you know, basically a good book, and it's good for magicians to add a gambling piece to their repertoire. It wasn't really until Vernon comes along, and Vernon, it only really catches when Vernon comes to New York in 1915, and then he uh, has a select circle, and that circle expands a bit in the 20s, that people are, start, are starting to see, because Vernon's telling them, this is the source of my, my work, really. Then he went to New York, and he went on the magic scene in New York, and he started showing these things to guys that they had no idea what he was doing. He always says when he came to New York, everyone was getting fooled by his work, and he was like, it's in Erdnays, and they were like, what, you can't re read that book, it's like reading geometry. It didn't really catch on uh, even after that, because Vernon offered lessons in Erdnays in the 40s, and he only had one person enroll, uh, so there's no interest there. The professor, you know, like doing all this great work with Erdnays, um, really just brought it to the attention in, uh, of everyone and got it the uh, respect it deserves. And then he took it, a lot of those principles, to the next level. I think most people, most magicians at that time, discounted this book. They said it's, it's like some kind of scientific journal. He gives these little short things, you know, what are you supposed to make of that? And, and Vernon would say, well, look, every word in that book is important. You can't just gloss over it. You have to take every sentence and dissect it. What does he mean, you know? It really took Vernon as that catalyst 
to show the possibilities that the work was not geometry and his work was so far ahead of anyone else's Vernon's in the 1920s that it's hard to imagine what a different wavelength it was on it. But what he really took from it was that naturalness of action and that's what Vernon's known for is he, he made magic natural and I think he got that from Erdnase. With Vernon saying for enough years, enough times, this is really important because of who he was, people said, you know what? Maybe this is important. We need to pay attention to this. And now, who was this Erdnase? That's what nobody knows. <clears throat> nobody knows because Erdnase asked, uh, he had Erdnase backwards, Erdnase, S W Erdnase. If you spell that backwards, it's E S Andrews. E S Andrews, spelled backwards. Now, this, whoever wrote the book wanted to, to disguise his identity, so he put his name backwards. The anonymity issue of the author is a peculiar one because if you want absolute anonymity, you publish a book anonymously. You put no name on the title page. There, done. No one knows who wrote it. You vanish into the woodwork. The end. That's anonymity. However, this guy appears to have put his name on the title page, but he disguised it a little bit. So it's pretty clear to me that he is either messing with all of our heads to some degree and we'll never figure out who the guy is, or he just didn't want total anonymity. He put a clue to his name on the title page by spelling his name backwards. It's not S.W. Erdnase, it's E.S. Andrews. There were three primary Erdnase sleuths, if you would, uh, in the first wave of investigators, if you could call that. And I would say Vernon was one of them. And Vernon uh, leaves, if he goes to New York, he comes back to Canada, and then he goes back to, he goes to Chicago in 1919 for a variety of reasons. The magic shops that he, he read about as a kid where he used to order things were there, but it was a hotbed of gambling activity. There's the Erdnase connection. Vernon goes there, but he had an acquaintance named John Sprong. And Sprong was uh, roughly the same age as what we call Old Man Drake, the, the, the publisher. And it was Drake, uh, it was Sprong who had a real interest in gambling work, who just badgered Drake to say, who is Erdnase? The only person that knew that was Drake, Old Man Drake, who the Drake Publishing Company in Chicago. And a friend of mine named John Sprong, he went to, the, to Drake and asked, he was the first one, he said, who wrote this book, Erdnase? He said, that's a funny name, Erdnase, Erdnase, Erdnase. I never heard a name <laughs> like that. And old man Drake told John Sprong, he said, well, I'll tell you something. He said, I can't tell you any more, but I'll just tell you, that spell that backwards and you'll know who the author was. So he put it backwards and got E.S. Andrews. And he eventually says to him, well, I can't tell you other than that the author's name is really Erdnase backwards. So we now know it's E.S. Andrews. And this information is, if it's from Old Man Drake, is prior to 1912 when Old Man Drake dies, or it's from the son who learned from the father. So we know that guy had a connection to, to Erdnase. So, but he said, well, tell me something about this man. And old man Drake says, I'm sorry, he disguised his name because he wanted to disguise his identity. And he said, I won't betray it. I, I, nobody, he doesn't want anybody to know who he was, so he disguised his name. And old man Sprung coaxed him and coaxed him. He said, I'm sorry, he said, no avail, I won't tell you. And then old man Drake died and he tried to get it from his son. The son said, I don't know, my father never told me. So. Now, Leo Roman was the second sort of Erdnase, I mean, the third Erdnase sleuth, if you had sort of Vernon and Sprong. And Sprong told Vernon in the 20s that it was E.S. Andrews. Now, Leo Roman is a book dealer, a rare book dealer in New York City who had a column in the Sphinx. And Roman, it's unusual for a magic book dealer to be interested in a book on pure sleight of hand. But Roman had an eye. And when he was asked to describe the 10 best books on magic written in the English language, he had Erdnase on his list, and that was in the 20s. And like a lot of rare book dealers at that time, he would seek out more information on the book. So he wrote to Chicago, most likely Drake, to find out. Tell me what you can about the author and things like this. And he basically says, 
Well, it turns out that the, the book, uh, the, the Drake acquired all existing copies and we get, by inference, the plates to, to reprint the book with no rights payable to the author. So it was like a buyout. And he says, somebody says, it's by the way, it's the real author was E.S. Andrews. Now I could see Drake saying to him, listen, I won't tell you who the author is, but you can't say it was me. But if you reverse the letters, it's that. And so Roman publishes that in the Sphinx. So we have Sprong who sort of learned that it's E.S. Andrews. We have Roman who learns it's E.S. Andrews. Nobody's looking for this guy. It's like, it's not like a big issue. There's no reason to fabricate anything. It's not going to increase sales. It's E.S. Andrews. And then the hunt became uh, somewhat more interesting in the, for the identity of the author in the 40s uh, when Martin Gardner took up the, uh, took up the challenge. Hey. His connection to Erdnays was he was the, one of the first people fascinated by the mystery. And Martin Gardner, he's, Martin Gardner spent thousands of postcards. He wrote to every high school and every public school in the country, in, in, that, in the United you're States. You're referring to the well-known contributor to Scientific he, he, American? Yeah, yeah, he annotated, annotated uh, Alice in Wonderland and it was translated to 10 different languages. He's a genius, this Martin Gardner. In fact, he's a kind of an Einstein, very clever. Good chess player, musical, an artist, a good magician, a writer. Martin Gardner, he writes for Scientific right. American, a different magazine. So what does Gardner do? Gardner writes, sends out 500 penny postcards to colleges and universities looking for any alumni named E.S. Andrews uh, that in the time period that he thinks would, would fit the age bracket. And he gets no response. So he assumes, well, maybe it's not E.S. Andrews. So maybe it's M.F. Andrews. M Milton Franklin Andrews is a great candidate, and many would still say the leading candidate, the best candidate, because he has a name that we like, most of us like, some people hate it, but the name Andrews. And he has the skill set that is described in the book. And really, very few other candidates have the skill set and very few have the name. And he, circumstantially, he's an interesting fit. He, we can place him in Chicago at some time. We don't know if it's the right time, but he definitely had gambling experience, spent time in Chicago. And he conveniently dies in 1905, which is before, it's soon enough, the book came out in, in 1902, he dies in 1905. It's like the O.J. Simpson story of the time where he's a suspected serial killer and the police know he's in town and they're looking for him and they knock on his door and two shots ring out and they break down the door. He's uh, dead, as is his girlfriend, apparently a murder-suicide. He shot her and then shot himself. That's the police version. There's some reasons to believe that maybe he was killed by the police uh, because uh, an account of his murder appeared in the papers before it happened. But that's a, a different issue. So they sell this story, and uh, he promulgates that myth of uh, you know, Milton Franklin Andrews. So that caused a lot of time and a lot of energy, I think, that's just distracted people from the hunt. You look at it carefully, the age is also a problem, uh, the writing ability is a problem. There are a lot of issues with him. We've done a fairly good job of ruling out some of our prior suspects. You know, the famous murder-suicide, I think, is nonsensical. I read the Milton Franklin Andrews book when I was little, and I was like, that's horrible. You know, this guy's so mean and tall and nasty. He doesn't sound like the guy that comes to me in the book, and I know the professor didn't uh, think that that could be the guy. Uh, Martin Gardner, who was a very good friend of Vernon's, thought it was because he could not accept that his idol might have been a murderer, a, you know, in a lurid, and died in this lurid way. He just couldn't accept that. You know, Martin Gardner's candidate, uh, Milton Franklin Andrews, uh, he wasn't a good guy. He was a murderer, and he was, I don't want to know that about Ernest. I don't want to know that he wasn't a good guy. And his big breakthrough, which came almost immediately, was he tracked down the man who illustrated the book, Marshall D. Smith. Martin Gardner in the 1940s um, had the idea that perhaps the illustrator of the expert at the card table, a guy named Marshall D. Smith, might still be alive. And if we can't find the author, maybe we can at least find the illustrator. And it was a great idea because indeed Smith was still alive. Gardner tracked him down. He, he went around, you know, trying to find people related to Erdnays and he was the one that went out to seek the illustrator, Marshall D. Smith and got in contact with him. And he was the first to recognize that, hey, the illustrator is named on the title page with over 100 illustrations from life by M.D. Smith. The book was done in Chicago, he knew that much. 
let's see if there's an M.D. Smith who's an artist in Chicago. Check the Chicago directory. Boom, Marshall D. Smith comes up. So he writes him a letter on December 10th. On December 13th, he gets an answer. We assume that's the timeline because it's dated. The letter responding to him is dated December 12th. And he goes over and interviews the guy on the 13th. So good mail system. He got it. He called the guy. He made an appointment. He went over to his apartment. In that initial interview, he gets a lot of information from him. The story that Smith recalled was that he does not exactly remember how he got the job, but that he met the author in a hotel room in Chicago, a cheap hotel room somewhere in Chicago. It was very cold that day. They met in winter, so probably December 1901, possibly January 1902. But I lean towards December 1901 just because of the time it takes to get the illustrations into a book and get it printed and things of that nature. And Smith had a strong recollection of his first initial meeting in this cold hotel room in a cheap hotel in Chicago. The room was described as being unheated, quite cold, so that the I think uh, either Smith or the author, according to Smith's recollection, kept their coat on. I think Smith might have kept his coat on. And the author had to rub his hands to keep them warm, but he was quite proud of his hands. Said he greased them, we're not sure what that means, but probably put some kind of liniment or oil on them to keep them soft. And Smith described them as, as softer than a woman's hands, and that the author was, was proud of, of his hands and what he could do. His sharp features, uh, light colored hair, I didn't say blonde specifically, but he didn't, and uh, clean shaven. He gives a fairly good physical description, uh, about five foot six in height, definitely not over five foot seven, between 40 and 45 years old. So sometime in the winter of 1901, 1902, uh, met him in a hotel room, was told what the job was, performed the drawings from life according to the title page, did not remember doing as many as there are in the expert at the card table. He thought he did about half that many. Did some illustrations, there's a question as to whether he did all the illustrations, and some of that questioning comes from his own recollection of being surprised when Gardner showed him the book. He'd never seen the book before. Showed him the book and it had 101 illustrations, and in his memory of 45 or so years before, he would have guessed that he did maybe 20 or 30. That's a pretty big discrepancy. He also said he didn't recognize the illustrations, uh, but he recognized the handwriting underneath them, figure one, figure two, figure three. He recalls making sketches, taking them home, inking them in, and bringing them back for approval. And he says the author was not concerned with artistic quality. Again, we're not quite sure what that means, but was concerned with accuracy. Paid by a low numbered check. You'll often see people say he was paid by a check numbered one. But the truth is, is what Smith said was a low numbered check, not necessarily check number one. He did get, as payment, he recalled, a check written on a large Chicago bank, a low numbered check indicating a new bank account, maybe someone who had just come from out of town to, to do this, which would explain the hotel room. He didn't think the man was from Chicago. He thought he was from the East, possibly New York. It's not clear why he thought that, but that was his recollection in reconstructing things. He was a little nervous about accepting the, the, a low numbered check, but the check cleared. That was the end of it. Never saw the guy again. He recalled that the man performed some of the slights on a, a small board, a squarish board covered with felt, probably you know billiard felt, and it had a, a rim on them. And in fact, there are a couple of illustrations where you can see the rim he's talking about. The illustrations are highly regarded in the sense of showing greater detail in terms of sleight of hand positioning than prior books, as is true of the level of detail in the description. It was definitely not an expose, which just says, uh, be careful because if someone's using marked cards, they might deal the second card from the top. It doesn't say, to deal the second card from the top, hold your hand in this position, move your thumb a quarter of an, you know, and, and this book has quite a level of detail. And the illustrations have a similar level of detail in terms of showing the exact hand positions, which not all prior books did. I feel that Smith's testimony, which is really the only really credible first-hand eyewitness account that we have of meetings with the author. There are other circumstantial ones that are interesting and worth paying attention to, but Smith is the guy who were, with a fairly high degree of confidence, we think, met the author in late 1901, probably, in Chicago. Almost the very first thing the illustrator says is, boy, that name Erdnace doesn't sound familiar with me. I thought it was a name with a W in it. Well, Gardner is all excited. He knows all about the E.S. Andrews theory. He apparently recognized that himself as a kid reading the book, and he had discovered it in his teens and, and fell in love with the book. Gardner immediately blurts out, in retrospect, we kind of regret that it was done this way, but he says, could it have been a man named Andrews? 
And the illustrator, according to Gardner's notes, his eyes light up and he immediately confirms that, says, yes, it was a man named Andrews. And Gardner writes him saying, you know, could it be this guy? I've discovered this gambler uh, who died uh, tragically in 1905. And we have uh, accounts of, of him doing, uh, he was a card cheat. We know he had the uh, knowledge for the material in the book. He's a Mr. Andrews. Could this be the guy? Does his name sound right? Milton Franklin. And the illustrator writes back saying, boy, the name Milton doesn't say anything to me. And Martin sort of has the uh, Milton Franklin angle and he kind of pushes that and because it's a sensational story. Murderer and card shark and he pitches it and sells it as an article to a magazine. And, uh, but the facts don't match up. I mean, the, you know, the height, the description, the MF. Sometimes you hear that he didn't do the best sleuthing, but at least he did it, you know. Smith, uh, the illustrator, would have been 29. So he's remembering a man significantly older than himself, a decade uh, or so older than he is. And in terms of the height, he specifically, when they get into this, and Gardner has a candidate, and his candidate, this uh, Milton Franklin Andrews, is quite a tall, thin man, uh, I believe six foot one and a half in his stocking feet, according to the police reports. And Smith says, there's, there's no way that's the guy I met. Had, had, he been, had it been that guy, I would have been looking up to him I was looking down on this guy. So it's a very specific recollection. But he also says, I'm pretty sure I met the author. He, he put his cards on the table is the term that Smith uses. And I, it was, I thought he was very open, honest with me. I think I met the guy. And if I did, it's not that guy. He's very specific on what he knows and what he thinks and what is possible. And one of the things he was not willing to, to fudge on was his recollection of the man's name or initials. But he's quite enthusiastic and endorses the Andrews theory. Now, in terms of how much weight you give Smith's recollection, I unfortunately, I give him a lot of weight because he's all we've got. However, eyewitness testimony is malleable and very unreliable and 40 years is a long time. It was not an important thing for him. He, we might have to dismiss it all, including the fact that he thinks he remembered the name Andrews. But uh, my feeling is until we have good cause to dismiss his recollection, let's start with that as our profile of the author, looking for someone, a short guy, which may be hard to verify, uh, who's in the 40 year, low 40s age range, whose name quite possibly is Andrews, who's in Chicago at that time. could cost you money, especially when it's crooked. Fours of a kind are powerful hands in poker, but they always lose to a royal flush. And the royal flush in this case is held by John Scarney, America's leading exposer of dishonest gambling. Like an athlete, Scarney keeps in training, but all his skill lies in his fingers and finesse. First, he stacks the deck to put the cards he wants on the bottom. Then he deals out the hands, dealing only to himself from the bottom and giving himself the four big aces, of course. Looking up through a glass top table, we can see how it's done. Notice again that he uses just half of the deck. According to Scarney, this is a tip-off to this cheating maneuver. This is not to say that highly trained card sharps can't deal from the bottom with an entire deck. It's just that a half pack makes it easier. When the deck is thin, it's almost impossible to detect bottom dealing. When a crook has four hidden aces, you're in trouble. So Erd Ace is known for a lot of different moves with a deck of cards. But one of the moves that he's most famous for is his bottom deal. And so where does that half the deck part come from? Well, it comes from this. Let's imagine that there are five players in our game. If you deal out five cards to each player, you're going to get rid of 25 cards. That's about that many. So those are gone. Now it's time to deal the draw. Now is when you would start the bottom deal. And notice we've only got a small packet of cards left. So it is perfectly legitimate to only practice bottom deals with a small packet of cards. And we've got those three aces on the bottom of the deck. As we deal cards like this, I am dealing all of these cards off the top, but at some point I'll take one off the bottom. There went one. 
deal a couple more like so. At some point, I'll take another one off the bottom. It's gone. We've still got one last card off the bottom, but I've got so few uh, cards left in my hand that it's, it's going to be, it would be hard to tell whether this came off the bottom or the top, but I can assure you it's gone because that's the bottom card. The Erdnay's bottom deal, Jason England uses it as a, his first step in teaching the bottom deal whenever he's teaching someone the bottom deal. And uh, I've found I switch to it when my hands are really dry. And, uh, you know, it's super helpful to have that extra security. And um, it's also great for certain like things like small packets. It's a very workable move. The only thing that people don't like about it is sometimes that rather peculiar grip that he uses. But um, it's still a workable move. It still fools people. It would still get the money if no one complained about the rather odd grip. And I think it's a terrific feat of engineering that he created that allows us to get in there and get those cards off the bottom of the deck as you're dealing. When dealing seconds, the top card is momentarily slid back and the next card is dealt. Cards can just as readily be dealt from the bottom or middle of the deck. The dealer can thus change the odds in his favor from 2% to 100% if he so desires. When people describe a second deal, they would just say, well, you push two cards and you take the one underneath the top one. Well, that's you know, a fine superficial level of understanding, but he's saying your know, exact finger position and how you do that and the timing, he really goes into the essence. They really are just, you know, second deal means moving the top card out of the way and taking the second card. And that's the whole description in the older books and Erdnays will tell you where the fingers are, you know, what you should be feeling, you know, like which parts of your hand are touching it and uh, really makes it quite splendid experience. <laughs> it's a lot easier to learn. Talk a little about false dealing. You've heard the term bottom dealing. Second dealing, is that something you've heard of? Yeah, you too as well, Larry. You guys have been around the block. Um, here's the way this works. Uh, if I had the ace of spades on top of the deck and we were playing in a game, I'd want to deal that card to Larry unless I didn't, which means that I wouldn't deal him the top card. I'd make it look like I was dealing him the top card, but I would be keeping it on the top. That's why it's called second dealing. It's an odd concept. It looks like the top card is coming off the deck, but in fact, it isn't. So this is something uh, that one could do, and um, this requires practice. <laughs> now, bottom dealing, some people say, is even a little more difficult. In this case, you'd place four aces on the bottom of the deck. And again, I want you to see that this is not an optical illusion. The aces really are on the bottom. What I'm going to be doing here, this works with five or six hands in the game, but in this case, I'm going to deal my opponents a card and myself a card. His cards come off the top, my cards come off the bottom. This is cheating. <laughs> well, folks, what I just demonstrated for you is uh, considered to be the granddaddy of all the gambling moves called the bottom deal. Those cards a second ago are actually on the bottom of the deck. A bottom deal. Naturally, the cheat has controlled the slug of desirable cards to the bottom. In this case, we're talking about the four aces. Let's try a five-handed game. You can see the aces are no longer on the bottom because they're now in my poker hands. Any time the dealer knows there's a desirable card on top of the deck, he can withhold that card from the other players and reserve it for himself by means of a second deal. The ace of spades is still on top. These cards were all pulled from directly under the ace, from the second from top position. If we turn the deck face up, it's easy to see how dealing deuces allows the dealer to keep the ace on top until he wants to deal it, rather than delivering it to whichever player should have received it. The second deals, you know, they're both pretty beautiful uh, push-off deals, you know, from either side. Uh, I've seen both of them done very well, and uh, his thoughts on it are spot on. Erdnays is a system, 
and you see many people when asked, I do it as sort of a trick question, what's the most important move in Erdnays? And they will say, well, it's the bottom deal. And I say, well, then that tells me that you know nothing about the board. Uh, because what Erdnays basically says is if I had to answer that question, it would be the bottom deal. But really, but if you can't locate and secure the cards, and if you can't fall shuffle, and if you can't circumnavigate the cut, then the bottom deal is useless. So every move more or less is really dependent upon another. Once I started reading the book and, you know, like, uh, taking it in, it was really just the detail involved. You can see it right from the very beginning. He gives you the uniformity of action, all these things like just here's your general stuff to always be aware of. And then you get right into the overhand shuffling. Like the first one is just keeping the top stuck. And at first he has you, you know, just keep the top top stuck and then there's like a throw at the end and you're like okay then he goes into detail on like not only that you can go through and shuffle the whole deck and it's like oh man you know your card magic should be like that you should be not just doing a move because it's quick you should think about the outward actions and really make them as deceptive as possible and once you kind of get that going you want to read more to find all the details you can, and then you want to apply that to all of your card handling. So it kind of becomes like a religious experience or something, I don't know, life-altering. And then I start looking into the shifts, uh, these techniques that uh, a gambler would use for nullifying the cut. So when the cards are cut and you pick them up to deal, if you put cards on the bottom or the top, you have to undo that cut. So this would be a shift. So how is he accomplishing the shift? And these things were incredibly difficult. He's got all these shifts, you know, and they're they're pretty awesome, especially for magic. They're probably wouldn't be that great at the card table or something like that. But, but also, one thing you mentioned was Erdnay said the shift has yet to be invented. Yes, and that was where he's yeah. a very clever. He's not. He doesn't say it's impossible to. To, to do a perfect shift, but he says the shift has yet to be invented, which yet is to be a very invented. nice way of putting it. Which is different from saying it's yes, impossible. Very yes. different from saying it's impossible. Yeah. I, I, I know there's some people that claim to have a perfect shift, you know, and uh, there's some awesome ones out there. Even Erdnaze's uh, one hand shift with the right cover and a few other ones are, are all great. And there are techniques in there like the SWE shift, which you know, is all but useless to magicians or cheaters. But as a piece of mechanics with cards is a lesson in and of itself that can be applied to more practical moves that are invisible, that are imperceptible. He says in his book, one of our constant but ever failing attempts to devise a perfect pass. Right. He says constant but ever failing. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, a perfect pass is movement of some kind. Right. I personally don't think there will ever be a way to invisibly transpose two packets without motion. I don't believe in natural, uh, but without perceptible motion. But I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, you know, within certain constructs. The right moment is the perfect shift, you know, like learning how to create a moment or uh, knowing when the moment's about to occur and making it happen is probably the, the perfect shift. But then we have to go back and we have to think about some of the observations he makes about sleight of hand itself, not about particular moves, but things that, you know, people should not suspect, let alone detect, is something that we've all tried to live by. Some of us have failed. But that is a really great bar to hold all sleight of hand to. I doubt that there's a contemporary card sleight of hand artist who doesn't talk about and use some version of diagonal palm shift. And the diagonal palm shift is, you know, remains a fascinating piece of study, a single slight that is not only commonly in use, that I use all the time, but that is uh, commonly under discussion and, refi and continuing refinement. Vernon had his own refinements on it. Now the diagonal palm shift is called a diagonal palm because it comes through the deck but diagonally. So when you do this move, it's well explained in our days. You push it in here, when I hold it this way, and square it up, that card is pulled back, like that. So therefore, when in the diagonal palm shift, when the cards are put down, I'll turn That's the hand up so you can see That's what good. happens. The card spins right into position in the palm, like that. 
The last time I was in Spain, I sat around with a bunch of Spanish magicians who were showing me their latest takes on the diagonal palm shift. And Ricky Smith in New York is famous for his refinements on the diagonal palm shift. One of my favorite moves in the book is definitely the diagonal palm shift. Like, it's such an amazing feat of engineering. It's almost the hand movements themselves that cause the card to revolve into the palm. It's just a, it's so awesome and there's cool variations that have happened. All my heroes were good at it. So I've always had quite a fascination with it. I used to search out people that I knew were great at it. Like I heard Roger Klaus was amaz amazing and John Carney. And uh, so I would go to conventions that they were at just to ask them about it. <laughs> oh man, the diagonal palm shift is uh, a weapon. <laughs> it is a pure weapon. If anything came from Expert at the Card Table, I think that idea is the most prominent and probably one of the most underused or incorrectly used moves uh, from that book. Compared to other slides at the time, you know, it's leaps and bounds. There's like a weird kind of side steal uh, maneuver in sex sleight of hand, you know, that's almost something. And then, uh, but it really was. People were doing the pass and doing and uh, palming cards. This turns th both those moves into one. Erdnays really hated that pass and palm because he, he says you should learn the overhand shuffle to control cards. You know, what? it's not a big deal if you shuffle before you give the cards out to be shuffling. And uh, so he's got two uh, alternatives for you, the overhand shuffle and the beautiful diagonal palm shift. I've often wondered, when did the sort of educational process shift from one illustration every 20 pages to suddenly two illustrations on a page, another two illustrations on a page, more illustrations when you get a few pages later. You know, if you look at old magic books prior to Erdnay's, they had illustrations, they had line drawings or woodcuts, but you got one illustration every 20 pages. And this guy comes along and says, I'm trying to teach these moves. I'm not just describing them, I'm really trying to teach them. And to teach them, I have to have the text in the right order, I have to have the right structure, I have to have everything uh, formatted properly, but I've also got to have a lot of illustrations. And so somewhere along the way, he decided that one illustration every 20 pages wasn't going to cut it, and he's really got one illustration every other page. I think it's relevant because it's a very well-written piece, and it describes the material in a way that the more you read it, the more you get out of it. So I've actually, you know, over the years, studied it more and more, looking for those little subtle lines, those little subtle details that I missed in the first read-through or the second or the hundredth read-through. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's endured is because the more you read it, the more you get from it. And when you go back and read it over and over, you, it, it's interesting. I mean, I've just by the fact that I've published it three times, I've read it many times. And it seems like, at least for me, every time I read through that manuscript, I'd say, well, I don't remember that. That's important. How did I miss that the first or the second or third time through? I will give you any card magic book published 35 years prior to Erdnays, and any card magic book published 35 years after Erdnays. In fact, you can have them all published in that 70 year span. You can have every card magic book you want from that 70 year span, 35 years prior, 35 years after. I'll take this one. That's how good it is. We as magicians who come to this world, or people who are interested in magic as well, we kind of take a perverse pleasure in the details of the techniques. And I think we're relating to that in the author. And certainly this material is not brand new to the author. He's taken it from all sorts of interesting places, but he has an approach to it and he has an attitude to it that comes through the writing and I think inspires another generation. He read other magic books and he read other gambling books and then he wrote a gambling and magic book that's nothing like those other books. I find that fascinating. I think he was definitely looking at uh, magic books at the time, trying to learn anything that he could apply. 
and uh, he knew enough to uh, disparage some ways magicians do things, and that means he must have seen someone, you know, like do some sleight of hand with cards. So I think he loved magic, and uh, but he, he probably, uh, like some of us, hated bad magic and uh, hated seeing things butchered. We are almost certain that Erdnace read other magic books and other gambling books prior to writing this. In fact, you can make a fantastic case that he had to have. There are approximately 13 named card effects in the back of this book. None of them belong to him. All of them come from other places. It's almost certain that Erdnace read New Era card tricks. It's the only book that precedes Erdnace, that has any level of precision in the description that's similar. I think he had a, a core repertoire, and, uh, and there were brilliant touches in that repertoire that he tweaked of even older pieces that had been in previous books. Uh, that uh, shows that he, he thought about it a lot. And I thought, well, the magic section, these are tricks I know. You know, I know the row of ten cards that was in another book I read, and I know this one. I, and then you look at it and you go, well, he's got a really nice touch on this. I don't think you should discount the magic section, but I definitely feel like the gambling section was his strong point. He was working on whole systems of sleight of hand, you know, versus here's a cool move, you know, and then it's not used in any of the tricks. He, he goes into description of multiple different hands, trying to get you to understand his whole uh, thinking behind, like the calling and stalking. So I just think the gambling section is so much more fleshed out. So was this written for other cheaters, or was it written for that market that's, that's highlighted at the back, the magicians who have an interest in card technique? He was cheated, he didn't like it, and so he started learning. He started educating himself about what had just happened to him. And in doing that education, he became an expert of a sort on his own. But in the same sense that uh, a detective is an expert in the techniques of murder, but doesn't go out and kill people to learn that. You know, he, you know, he goes to school, he reads, he talks to other experts, and he finds out how to investigate crimes. This guy has taken it upon himself to teach himself what to look out for because clearly he was a gambler, at, at least on some level, wanted to continue gambling, we can presume, and wanted to educate himself. Focus is so much on gambling at a time when it wouldn't have been cool to be a gambling expert or anything like that. So to me, it's a passion for him and he loves it. And he talks about it like he loves it. And he talks about his favorite things in that regard. My thinking has evolved over the years about whether Ernest was actually a gambler or a cheat. Um, I long thought that he was, who had a, a rare interest in magic. Um, I've been swayed by some that that may be less likely than I once thought, and that he may have been a magician with a deep interest in gambling. Uh, I think that he had a real job. I think that uh, the romantic notion of this itinerant card cheat just doesn't really exist. You know, everyone was a gambler back then. I, that's in my imagination. They didn't have movies or anything else to do. Everyone played cards. Even if you're playing with your family, you know, that's still, you know, you're still playing cards. Now, one of the arguments against the notion that he was actually a, a hustler is that, well, a hustler would never do this much work on magic. And although on, I accept that argument on the face of it, in reality, that argument doesn't sway me in and of itself. The language in Erdnase is exclusionary of both gamblers and magicians. So when Erdnase writes, he talks about this is what the gamblers do. Those guys are doing this. And this is what the magician's doing. Those guys are doing this. And it's almost as if he considers himself an outsider to both groups. He's, he's interested in both areas, clearly. He wrote a book about both areas. But he doesn't really consider himself a cheater. He would have used the term advantage player. He doesn't really consider himself a magician. Although, obviously, he knows a little bit about both worlds. Because, because of the opinion of some experts I, I respect, because of the thoughts of, that I've 
gleaned from Steve Forty, for example, who has a strong belief that he was that Erdnase was purely a magician. Um, I'm inclined to doubt a little more that he was an actual working hustler, but I don't think he was just a distant viewer. I think he was fascinated. I think he probably moved in those circles, knew those people. Whether or not it was relevant as in, in terms of cheating or working at a table, that is, that is in doubt. And my, my money would definitely be on it being an intellectual exercise by someone who has a fascination with this topic rather than an expert cheat deciding to, you know, lift his skirt and show you what he's really doing. So I'm often asked, what do real cheaters think of this book? And you'll hear different people say different things. Some people, mostly magicians, will tell you that this is the Bible for card cheaters and that they've all read it and they were all turned out by this book. You will hear other people say that they've talked to a thousand different cheaters and none of them have ever heard of this book. So where does the truth lie? Well, clearly it lies somewhere in the middle. But it's closer to the they've never heard of it end of the spectrum than most magicians would like to admit. As far as the impact on the gambling community, I don't think it has any impact whatsoever. Uh, the gambling community is a complete separate community that works on a whole different set of rules and techniques. Uh, you know, they work in teams. Most, ma most magicians are alone. You know, it's, it's a whole different mindset. And the techniques that are, you, that are talked about from magicians to gamblers usually don't apply. There's, I think there's only like one or two things that have ever made it from magic to gambling or vice versa. He liked the movements. He liked the way the cards felt in his hand, the way they moved in his hand. He liked the manipulation itself. That to me says immediately he was not a diehard cheater. If he was a diehard cheater, he wouldn't care anything about the beauty of it. He just wants the money. That's how they all were. They just want the cash. They would, they would play with marked cards in a heartbeat. They would play with holdouts. They would play with reflective surfaces, shiners, mirrors. They would play with cold decks. They would do all of that stuff because all they cared about was the money. This guy says he needed the money, but he didn't care about any of those things because what he loved was the movement. He loved the engineering. So the application is, is what gets you the money. You use it here and you use it then and you win money. And really cheats, that's all they care about. Is this worth my time? Will this move earn its place in my repertoire and all those hours I have to spend and then all those risks I have to take doing it? Whereas this guy's kind of talking about the beauty of the move and the elegance of the technique. People who cheat at cards, are, they're not secretive at all. I mean, they, people will say they guard these things. They're dying to show you. And the reason they're dying to show you is because they can't show anybody else. So they can finally find somebody who actually appreciates the level of skill and effort that went into mastering something. They want to strut as much as anybody else. Plus, you know, trade and learn little arcane bits of information that, that will help them. So people would say, well, why would a gambler reveal that? Well, they do it all the time. If you really look at people who cheat, real cheaters, the techniques that are in the book are completely wrong completely wrong that the the way they hold the deck where their fingers are the timing it's it's more of a to me a theoretical explanation of if you were in a certain circumstance this would be the perfect action but in actual use to claim that it's used in gambling i think it's completely incorrect do i think the book is uh full of material that was that was being used or is being used by professional card cheats. No, there are different ways of doing a second deal. There's a different way of doing a bottom deal. These shifts all have other variations that are probably better for modern situations. There are a few card cheaters that I've met over the years that have said, yes, I saw that book in an old gambling catalog. I was moving and grooving in card games and dice games when I was, uh, you know, in my 20s and 30s. So I bought a copy and I read it and I set it aside and I went right back to doing what I was doing. So are they reading the book? Yeah, most of them have thumbed through it, but they get turned off sometimes by the complexity of the text, by the complexity of some of the moves, and they just go back to whatever they were doing before they discovered this book in the first place. And it's interesting that all the professional cheaters that I've known who've come across the book, which is pretty much all of them, have found it interesting 
and have used, I don't think, anything from there. But it certainly gets you into that art form and it introduces you to this, to the concepts of sleight of hand. However, somebody in the gambling world was buying this book for about 70 years because it's in every single antiquarian gambling catalog that I owned published after 1902. So the Casey Card Company out of Chicago, the Hunt and Company out of Chicago, other different Mason and Company that were closer to the East Coast and then also in Chicago, all of those old gambling supply houses for 70 years until they got shut down were advertising this book to their customers. And their customers were, by and large, not magicians. So someone in the gambling world for 70 years was buying this book and continuing to drive sales, at least to some small degree. The fact that Erdnace came up with these odd eccentric shifts and thought about magic tricks is not a definitive debunking of the notion that he could have also been a hustler. On the other hand, where he may make mistakes about hustling uh, that an expert might point out, I'm, I'm more given to that argument. My thoughts on this have evolved over the years, but I'm more and more convinced these days that he was neither one, at least not in the big sense. He was not a performing professional magician that traveled the world and made all of his money from magic. I don't buy it for a second. I also don't believe for a second that he was a hardcore card cheater that made all of his money from beating people in card games. I don't believe that for a second. Did he cheat from time to time in small stakes games or in very safe spots? Yeah, he probably did. He writes like he could have done that. Did he occasionally perform a few card tricks for people? Sure, I don't have any problems believing that. But I don't think he was a professional cheater and I don't think he was a professional magician. I just don't know what he was. Great card cheats have what I would call a capacity for management. Uh, and that capacity for management comes from the fact that, well, you have to uh, play multiple games simultaneously. The game at the table and the game of securing, locating, you know, stocking cards and full shuffling and everything else and keeping the dialogue and keeping the money at the table. Like, it requires a really multi, an ability to multitask that, uh, that magic doesn't have. I also think in the end it doesn't matter very much whether Erdnace was actually a magician or a gambler because even if we could answer that question suddenly, it would not change the fact of his influence one iota. I think the tricks are probably the least important part of the book. I think the idea of the techniques are the most important part, but I think more important than that is people's willingness to take a jump into something they don't understand. And I think if people looked at that more, they would have a broader spectrum of their, what they're doing in general, not just from expert the card table, but I think that's a good place to start. Just a wealth of information and a lot of paths you can follow to get you where you're going. It's, it's not easy material. And it shouldn't be easy material. I don't think magic should be easy. I think a lot of people take magic for granted. And even if they buy one of these new $4 plastic tricks, it's hard to perform in front of people. It takes absolutely years to master this stuff. Like, years. There are people who claim they can do everything in, in ordinaries. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, I thought you left, sir. Don't get bored, because these are of interest to people who do magic. Revelations was Vernon's manuscript of personal commentary, notes, thoughts about Erdnase. And although we knew it existed, very, very few had seen it. Di Vernon wrote his treatise on uh, expert at the card table. So I had heard about Revelations like everybody else. I mean, it had been talked about and rumored about that this had been written by Di Vernon and Fawcett Ross at Fawcett's house in St. Joseph, Missouri. And back in those days, in the 50s, uh, Jay Marshall uh, was, was the owner of, at that time, with Francis, uh, Ireland Magic Company, and it became Magic Incorporated. And Jay said, I'll publish this. Well, everybody knew Jay, and Jay had published things, and so... 
they made a deal and they sent the manuscript to Jay Marshall in Chicago. And Jay said, we need photographs. We need to illustrate the, this manuscript with photographs. And Dye's, one of his sons was a photographer. So Dye Vernon <clears throat> got together with his son who set up the camera and Vernon had the cards. And uh, as far as I know, Percy Diconis was there and Dye posed with cards in hands to illustrate uh, everything they had written in Revelations. They printed the photographs, they sent them all out to Jay Marshall and nothing happened. And at some point they said, well, when is this book going to come out, Jay? And Jay said, we lost the photographs. Then it disappeared. There, there were photos taken of it and uh, he had mentioned it several times that he had worked on it and wanted it published in letters and in magazines and uh, it never came out until 1984. And an unfortunate history where it was handed over for publication and then it wasn't and then it was handed over again and then it was taken into secrecy deliberately and uh, there, there's this whole chain of events that kept the, the book from being published. Okay, so Percy got together with Di again, with Di's son, they set up and they reshot all the photographs and at the time, we now know, Vernon said, while we're all here and we've got this camera going, um, there's some other things I'd like to do, like the ping pong ship, this legendary pass, and, and he photographed that. And uh, topping the deck, something that later appeared in Select Secrets, one of Vernon's little pamphlets, they photographed that. And they sent all those photographs to Jay Marshall and time went by and they said, when is this book going to come out? And Jay said, well, we lost the photographs. Now, that sounds ridiculous and impossible unless you've ever been to Jay Marshall's house. And then it's not only believable, it's like, well, of course he lost them. He loses everything. And, and once, I mean, if you took a book off Jay's shelf and looked at it and put it back in the wrong spot, he wouldn't find that book for 20 years. And after decades had gone by, Percy said, look, Jay, he did have the typed manuscript. We're going to give you one more year to publish this book. Find those pictures and publish this book. And if you don't in a year, we want I, I want that manuscript back, Percy says. <clears throat> and Jay said, OK. And a year went by and he sent the manuscript to Percy. So now Percy has it. By this time, I was publishing magic books. And I thought, and I knew Vernon, and I knew that Vernon wasn't certainly getting any younger, and he, he'd waited a long time for this book to come out. So I said to per Percy, let's publish Revelation. So Percy came out, and he spent maybe a week with the professor going over the manuscript, and Vernon saying, oh, I always wished we'd put this in there, and he'd talk about things, and Percy would write it all down, and and Percy would say, remember that thing, Professor, you showed me the, and he said, I'll be darned, I forgot. And they'd write that down. So they ended up with additional material. And Percy wrote it all into a great, big, long forward. I, it's one of my favorites. And I, I love the introduction by Percy Diaconis. It's got all this cool history. It's got an amazing card effect. And in fact, a reference to a whole routine that would, would be a great routine. This is the first edition of Revelations. This is the deluxe edition. My good friend, Frank Simon, who was a, besides being a wonderful magician, was a great photographer. He took this photo of the professor that really catches who the professor was at that moment in his life. Uh, we produced 300 copies of the deluxe edition. This is copy number three. Uh, and I had to take these, pages, these deluxe pages, which I hand printed uh, on an old printing press myself over to the Magic Castle one afternoon and I met the professor there so that he could sign them. And he took an English penny and he laid the penny on the page and he traced around it to make a perfect little circle and then signed his name in that circle. And without looking up, he signed all 300 copies that afternoon. So the book came out and everybody hated it. They hated it. Because of the level of buzz and myth about it and speculation and also because of the delay in its publication, 
By the time it first came out, it was disappointing to many because many who were paying attention knew that a lot of the material there had already been released by then. It had already come out in various forms, in the Inner Secret series and in other forms. And so a lot of people sort of said, is that all there is? It's funny, like, I heard all that, and then I read what's in there, and it's awesome. <laughs> I was so impressed. Because of our design, by having the page here and the annotations here, there were many, many pages in this book that were blank in the margins because Vernon didn't have anything to say about that. People got this book and they'd flip through it and they'd see that half the pages were blank and they said, this is a ripoff. Uh, they must have pulled out all the good information, which is ridiculous if they thought about it. It's funny because at the time people were like, oh man, you know, they weren't so excited. There was a lot of white space, you know, because they chose to do it side by side on an original edition. And then to make matters even worse, that led to all this sort of conspiracy theory that material had been deliberately redacted from the book. The reason they hated it is because they'd waited 25 years for this. And they imagined this is going to be the holy grail of magic books. This will be the greatest book on close-up card magic ever in history. When in fact, it was Vernon and Fawcett Ross spending probably a couple of weekends together and, and Vernon going through the book and saying, hey, you know what? And Fawcett typing as fast as he can. And that was it. It's not something he slaved over for years. It was a couple weekends. And it was very important, good information that they wrote down laying out the book with these wide margins. It seemed like a clever idea at the time, but it made, it left so much blank space that, you know, and that's what a conspiracy theory is. It's usually stuff you use, you invent to fill blank spaces in the record. And so it just uh, made all that even worse. And I think it was $27 when it came out. And, that, you know, that, that's a great deal. <laughs> the first edition had gone out of print and as, often happens, prices started to go up on secondhand copies. And enough time went by and the price went high enough that I thought, you know what, maybe it's time to reprint this. It seems like there's still demand for this book and we could do a smaller second printing. And one day, David Ben, my friend from Toronto, Canada, called me and said, hey, uh, would you be interested, because you're the copyright holder, of doing another edition of Revelations? And I said, well, I'm actually thinking about doing that. And he said, well, stop the presses. Jay Marshall had passed away and they had begun the epic job of cleaning out Jay Marshall's house. And in the process, they found the typed manuscript for Revelations, one of them, the, th the one that had been given to Jay all those years ago. And then they found a stack of photographs. And it was the, the first stack of photos that they had originally lost that Vernon's son had taken. And in digging through the rest of this mountain of stuff, they found the second set of photographs. And they were different. I mean, because Vernon was just trying to remember, you know, which ones he had posed for and, you know, some he'd forgotten and others he had added. And so they were too big. And when you put these together, there were, were many duplicate photographs. But by putting them together, you really had a complete set of photographs. So now everything changes. This is unbelievable. We can now do what Di Vernon set out to do back in the early 50s. So we put this book together. And it's funny. This book, everybody loved when it came out. They thought, oh, finally, here it all is. And what this book proved was is that the information that was in the first book, uh, everything that was supposed to be there was there. They hadn't kept anything out. In fact, uh, as Percy Diaconus always described it, there's about 110% in there. All the stuff that was in the original manuscript and all the stuff that uh, he and the professor had added in later years. So throughout this book are those many, many, many lost photographs. These are the original typed pages. So it's really all in here. And uh, everybody loved this book and David Ben added a lot of material and he figured out what all those extra photos were for that these are for the ping pong shift that this is from topping the deck and all of that appears in here and uh so this one 
I, as far as I know, was universally acclaimed. He felt that there were some things that were maybe could have been written better in the in the original book, and so Mike Caveney uh, and David Ben and, and Vernon put out uh, a revel the revelations in the book, the things that maybe were wrong or could should have been expanded on. Because although this text and this text is the same, there's a lot more information in here. You know, all all of his details are really great, and it, like usually it becomes the way, or he points something out. You know that. Um, you, you would have missed, you know, because it was a detail that would have taken years of study of that paragraph to figure it out. And I was fascinated with Revelations. It's a later edition of Revelations that David Ben was involved with and that uh, Mike Cave these magic words also produced uh, is uh, such a, a beautiful idea there that it begins with a facsimile a complete facsimile of the original Vernon handwritten manuscript. It's a beautiful thing. And it really gives uh, substance to what it was at the time, what it meant at the time that it was written. I wouldn't sell this to a beginner. Uh, I, would, I don't even, wouldn't even sell it to somebody that's been in magic six or eight months because there's a lot of information here that I think you kind of have to earn this, this book. This is a $7 book and it's no big deal and it's relatively hard, so nobody's gonna do it. But I think between these two books, the one that David Ben and Mike Caveney did, and Mike Caveney and Darwin Ortiz did, if you could get all of this material in your brain, you'd have a way better understanding of this book. Well, Darwin Ortiz was one of the, the young guys, uh, young in comparison to Vernon, certainly, who, who took Vernon's advice and got this book and studied it and studied it for his entire life. Darwin Ortiz was the guy that was in the magic community that was doing riffle stacking, you know, false shuffles, push through shuffles, you know, the false dealing, and to like a degree, you know, bordering on, you know, like just like he's very much a perfectionist. And unlike what Vernon and Fawcett did with Revelations, where they, they just wrote their thoughts about the words printed on the page, how to improve or what to consider when you're working on this move. Darwin really expanded uh, his outlook on this. He really did his homework. He did a lot of research into what had already been in print at that time, uh, what gamblers were familiar with at that time, 1902, what they weren't familiar with. And, and he wrote a manuscript called The Annotated Erdnes. Richard Kaufman, had mentioned doing a, a re-illustrated version of Erdnays or Erdnays with photos or something like that. But the project had kind of stagnated and uh, Darwin Ortiz was the one who picked it up and really went with it. Not only is it full of awesome photos of, I think, Steve Freeman's hands, which, you know, one of the great card handlers of all time, and you get to see him, you know, doing all these slides is a wonderful treat. He also annotated the whole book with references to older things that were related and newer things that were related. And the guy who ended up with the rights to that book was a very good and very old friend of mine, Bill Taylor. And Bill came to me and said, do you want to publish the annotated Erdnase? And I remember saying, I think I already did. Uh, but when he showed me this manuscript with the photographs and the, the history it, I thought it was fantastic, and I said, I'd absolutely love to do that. Reading through the book, you know, and it's not just, you know, footnote one, and then one, see this book. He tells you about it and what's important about it. And so for me, it was a great, like, t touchstone, you know, to help me, like, move out in all these directions in my card work. And, uh, you know, I didn't know that Earl Nelson had videotapes and, you know, other things and... Because of that, you know, I was reading Erdnays and also getting pushed in these new directions that were very helpful and helped increase my knowledge. So thanks, Darwin. By resetting the type for the whole Expert at the Card Table book um, and and scanning the, the illustrations and starting the layout from scratch, we were able to put things more logically where they belonged. And then instead of having blank, big wide blank margins like the original Revelations had, uh, I think there's more 
of Darwin's annotations than there are than there is of original text. So I got his books, and that was my first kind of foray into like riffle shuffle work and a few other things, and actually using second dealing and bottom dealing and tricks. You know, that was pretty rare at the time. And I have to say that that is what we call a forever book. I'm sure it's in its at least its fifth printing and it continues to sell. And when people say, which do you recommend revelations <clears throat> or the annotated urdinase? <clears throat> Sorry, you have to get both of them. Uh, they're completely different animals and they're both tremendously valuable. And uh, Darwin did a great, great thing by making that research available to the magic world. One day I went to my mailbox and opened it up and there was a beat up brown box, cardboard box, pretty thin, from Martin Gardner, two H&R Magic books with no, he hadn't called to say I'm sending you a book or anything. And when I took it home and opened it up, uh, it had a first edition copy of Expert at the Card Table. Now we'd never had one before. They're quite scarce. I started at that time tracking them as part of my research and have at this point identified close to a hundred first edition copies worldwide and part of that is to get a lower bound on how many how many copies were printed by the author which would tell us something interesting but also hoping that somewhere out there there's a copy that's possibly inscribed by the author or has some other clue about the authorship issue. I keep waiting for uh, the day when I throw open a first edition and it says E.S. Andrews authored this book he lived at you know such and such street in Chicago Illinois the end you know it's not happened yet, and uh, I'm not liking my chances so far. There's about 50 or so different editions. Um, I have a lot more than that because I have many duplicate copies. And I've looked through these duplicates over the years for clues to possibly the author's identity. Nothing concrete, a couple of little interesting dates here and there that help you date certain undated uh, versions of the book. Nothing more than that. I've uh, examined probably a dozen or more first editions in my lifetime. I have two copies myself. The most serious collector of the book that I know personally is Jason England. He wants every single edition. But you couldn't ask for anybody who knows more about the book than Jason from the inside out, not just the history, not just the, the different editions. He's a genuine expert on expert. And I have wound up with what I believe to be, I can't prove it, but I believe to be the largest collection of different printings of the expert at the card table in the world. Uh, there are a couple of other people that have very large collections, and so I might not be in number one. We may be, I may be neck and neck with a couple of other buddies of mine, but I think it's probably the largest by a couple of volumes. You know, first editions of this book go for thousands of dollars, uh, which is very rare for a book, even more rare for a magic book. That's pretty crazy. Owning the book in various forms has become, at the moment, amongst young and old card magicians, the objective to own various versions. And this book is an exact replica of the book, of the original first edition. And this, is, this came out in 2014, and it's still relevant, and it still sells, and it's 50 bucks. It's the exact same thing. But this is now out of print, and the guy made a few hundred, and they're gone. So I'd gotten this book from him, that was quite surprising because it was something valuable that he'd sent uninsured book rate. And it's signed on the title page by Marshall Smith. And I knew from a man who was Erdnace the story of him having done this interview and these things. This is in 1999 in the summer. Uh, and we called and talked to Martin Gardner and told him we thought because it was valuable, but we didn't know how valuable, that the best way to determine a fair market price would be to sell it at auction. And we thought eBay was an interesting marketplace for those things, would find, if it were properly publicized, a fair market value for it at that time. So he suggested at that time that, well, you know, I've got all these research materials to make the auction more interesting, because the book was frankly not in that great condition. It had great provenance, Gardner's exciting, signed by the illustrator on the title page, but it was falling apart, and the paper was quite brittle, uh, it just had a lot of issues. Why don't I send you all my research materials, we'll include those as part of the auction. I said, sure, you know, we're not going to turn down an offer like that. So in terms of my own personal fascination with the mystery, when I got Gardner's materials and started to arrange them for the auction, I became, I, reading his correspondence with Marshall Smith, the illustrator, it becomes clear that Smith is unwilling to accept 
the candidate, Milton Franklin Andrews, based on, mostly on his height. The thing that he thought, and that Gardner initially thought, might crack the case wide open, is he, in talking with Gardner, he says, the author, the man I met whose hands I was illustrating, told me that he was related to Louis Dalrymple. Now, Louis Dalrymple was quite a well-known a uh, political cartoonist would be the equivalent today. He did uh, cartoons of Teddy Roosevelt and other political figures of the day. And it was a natural thing, in a way, to come up in conversation because the illustrator, Smith, had aspirations at that time of doing illustrations for that kind, at that level, of that kind of magazine. So it might come up in their conversation, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Oh, really? I'm related to Louis Dalrymple. And then David Alexander called and said, it's not Milton Franklin Andrews, it's someone no one's heard of, but the evidence is right in front of you, it's staring everybody in the face, they're not seeing the forest for the trees. It wouldn't tell me who it was, and I wasn't pressuring him, but it, you know, it was a curious conversation, and uh, he was a fun, was a fun conversationalist, so I found it very intriguing. One of the things that David Alexander had said in his dropping hints was that the book is so well written, it's extremely unlikely that this would be the author's first writing experience. It takes years to become a, a, a writer with a unique, confident voice like the book has. It's surely a, a previously published author of some kind. Well, in seeing that and, and believing from his, the way he developed his testimony and doesn't make up stuff as helpful as he's trying to be, I thought, let you know, and I'd had this conversation months earlier with David Alexander where he says, I know who it is and it's not the guy everybody thinks. I thought, well, let me, let me poke around, see who I can find. You know, we can do all this stuff online. I went to the Library of Congress, started looking for authors named Andrews. There are some E.S. Andrews, but none of them matched it. I found other E.S. Andrews, one a riverboat captain in Western Canada. The book has a Canadian copyright. I thought that was kind of interesting, got some samples of his writing. So on bouncing around, um, I was looking for those kinds of things. And fairly early in that hunt, uh, I came up with a, a James Andrews candidate. And Gardner had very early on been very fascinated by the possibility that maybe the man's name wasn't E.S. Andrews. Maybe the E.S. came from the last letters of his first name, which might have been James. James ends with the letters E.S. If you reverse James Andrews, you get S.W. Erdnase M.A.J. If you drop the M.A.J. because it looks goofy, then you get the right pseudonym. So I had a James Andrews candidate that I thought was great. The more I found out about him, the better he fit. We have reason to believe that the author was in Chicago in the early 1890s, possibly attracted by the 1893 World's Fair, which brought in a lot of gambling activity, obviously. He go is educated on the East Coast, uh, went to law school, I think, in upstate New York moves back to Illinois to start his practice, originally in Sterling, Illinois, but then uh, moves to Chicago in the 1890s, was the author of a number of legal treatises, self or so described as treatises on the, the title pages, as is the expert. Most of them published in Chicago, as was the expert, starting in the early 1890s through about 1903. He moves from Chicago to New York uh, in, eight, in 1903 when the book drops in half price. So you can say, well, that's a good circumstantial case for that's why the book price dropped. And when I got copies of his books, I could call out passages that to me had a similar tone, similar voice. James, his full name was James DeWitt Andrews, so J.D. Andrews, or usually James D. Andrews, but often full name James DeWitt Andrews. He was born and raised in western Illinois, in uh, Sterling, Illinois, which is in the adjacent county to Dalrymple's home. In fact, they were once one county, so I'm thinking maybe there's a Dalrymple connection. In my thinking was, if I can relate him to Dalrymple, who's in the adjacent county, if I can find that family connection, case closed. What are the odds? Perfect name, et cetera, et cetera. So I start to research the Dalrymple genealogy, and my thinking was, in their conversation, if the author had said, oh, yeah, Dalrymple's my cousin, I think you'd remember that 40 years later as a relationship. But if he said, Dalrymple's my wife's cousin, 40 years later, they're related. You know, that's, that's abstract enough. You know they're related. You can't remember the details. So I thought, uh, let's go to the Illinois marriage records, which are available online through 1901, and search for, did any men named Andrews na marry women named Dalrymple? Nothing. Did any men named Andrews marry women named Seeley? And you have to check the variant spellings because of those issues. And boom, I think two names popped up, one of whom uh, was a, an Edwin S. Andrews who married a Dolly Seeley in Sterling, Illinois, my guy's hometown, uh, in 1898, I believe. So I say, wow, that's how this lawyer, you know, his, his cousin or some, you know, someone married, that's how, that's how, if I can find out how this Edwin S. Andrews is related to James, 
case closed. So I began to investigate Edwin S. Andrews. At that time, not even recognizing that his name is a better match because he's an E.S. Andrews, not a James Andrews. And the more I found out about this Edwin S. Andrews, who was a train agent with the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad, uh, based at that time out of Denver, he'd gone back to, to marry this woman in Illinois, the better candidate he became circumstantially. Everything I could find out about him was very seductive. I'd find out a piece that's like, wow, that's exactly what we expect. What I knew about him was he was, when he got married, he was living in Denver as a train agent. I didn't know his history in Chicago. And as I developed that, it was clear he was in Chicago in the 1890s, as we'd like to think. Then he got transferred to Denver. Then he disappears from Denver around 1901. It's like, well, where does he go? And then I found out through uh, various helpers in the train community, train collecting community, that he got transferred from Denver to DeKalb, Illinois, which is just 60 miles west of, of Chicago. So he was the train traveling agent stationed in, he's not a, a travel agent, he's based there, but he travels around soliciting clients, troubleshooting, that kind of stuff. So he's, he's, he's within striking distance of Chicago, an hour away by train. And then I find out that n although he's stationed in DeKalb, he's actually living in effectively Chicago, but he's not in the Chicago directories because he's in a Chicago enclave, Oak Park. Quite a well-known enclave. It was the home of Edgar Rice Burroughs, who created Tarzan. It was the home of Frank Lloyd Wright. But that's why he's not in the Chicago directory, because technically, in fact, he's living on a street called Austin Boulevard, which runs north-south. He's on the west side. On the east side is Chicago. So he's across the street from Chicago, literally. And he's living a third of a block from the railroad track that would take him to work if he needed to go to DeKalb or take him in 10 minutes downtown if he wanted to meet with a printer or an illustrator. And the clincher for me was like, there's no way this is a coincidence, is in 1903, in March, uh, I'm sorry, in February, February 15th, 1903, less than a year after the book has been available for sale, it drops in price from the stated $2 price on the cover and the first advertised price that we know of to just one dollar. So it's been effectively remaindered. We need to kind of understand why that happened and so there are various theories. And then my guy gets transferred from being traveling agent in DeKalb, Illinois, he gets transferred to San Francisco in February of 1903, the very month that the price is known to drop. Initially I thought James DeWitt Andrews, that's got to be Alexander's guy and he wouldn't tell me his so I wouldn't tell him mine but from the information he gave it was clear we had different candidates. I had no idea who his was and I wasn't telling him who mine was because I was like, I'm the guy, I discovered her. So we both invited to present our theories in research at the Los Angeles Conference on Magic History in the fall of 1999. And I went first and he went, followed me in the public presentation, but he was nice enough the night before to give Charlie Randall, my roommate, business partner, and I his presentation, both to practice it, I'm sure, and but to let us know what to expect. And it was totally out of left field. It was someone we'd never heard of. It was a way of thinking about the problem that I had. He was not looking at a simple anagram. He was looking at a complex anagram. At our uh, Los Angeles Conference on Magic History one year, we had two guys present their stories of, of who they thought the author was. Both of them very interesting and very convincing, and only one of them could have been right if either one were right. I was at the, con at the history conference when uh, David Alexander and Richard Hatch were going to talk about Erdnase, and there were phone calls in the weeks leading up to the conference with friends and colleagues, well, what do you think they're gonna say? What do you think they've got? And I kept saying to everyone, um, I, I don't think we're gonna, you're going to find Erdnase, but I, I'm pretty sure that um, we're going to debunk uh, Milton Franklin Andrews. So what does David do? He does basically the same thing Gardner does, but just ramps it up. He uh, checks out the census uh, in the U.S. You know, for the various times period. He uh, goes on the genealogical sites to find family trees of you know, Andrews. And he says, he does this exhaustive research, and he cannot find a single E.S. Andrews. As many of you already know, S.W. Erdnase is the name E.S. Andrews spelled backwards. So the first step I took was to find evidence for the existence of an individual named E.S. Andrews. And to that end, I joined various Andrews genealogy groups on the internet, made up of hundreds of Andrews and people of Andrews descent, all searching and researching their family lines. I continually ask, does anyone have a line on an, a male, E.S. Andrews, born around 1860, that's the time frame that we have from Marshall Smith's description of Erdnase being 40 to 45 years old in late 1901. 
nothing was forthcoming, and after two years, I abandoned that line of inquiry as unproductive. Not one. Therefore, he didn't exist. Therefore, it can't be just the name backwards as an anagram. It must be a complex anagram. So he creates this, you know, search engine that gets all these things. He's just missed it, like, completely. If you wanted to hide your identity, you wouldn't hide it by spelling the name backwards. Too transparent. But if you're proud of your work, as the author clearly is, you'd want your name for personal ego reasons on the title page. So he, his theory was a more complex anagram. If Erdnays wanted to remain completely anonymous, why didn't he simply sign his name anonymous or a reformed gambler or some such impenetrable literary device? Why use the rather simplistic and transparent mechanism of spelling the name E.S. Andrews backwards? That isn't any way to successfully disguise a name, especially when it spells out a fictitious surname, Erdenes. Yet Erdenes's actions indicate he desired anonymity. Yet the nonsense of the backwards spelled name. For the original title in its original typography, all of that contains a clue that leads to his true name. You will note in the original title page, the words at and the are tiny in comparison to the other words of the title. Not just small, but tiny, way out of proportion to what a good design would demand. The word and should logically be of smaller size as well, but it is only slightly smaller than the main words. We believe this is a design with a purpose. We believe that Erdenes wanted us to ignore those two small words and apply the same principle to the title as we did to his name, namely reading it backwards. So by eliminating the words at and the and treating card table as one word, which it is in normal usage, like motion picture or tape recorder, we read the title backwards and get card table subterfuge, Andrew's artifice. Card table subterfuge, Andrew's artifice. So if E.S. Andrews is a subterfuge and an artifice, what is it? Ironically, it has been correctly identified by a number of writers as what it truly is, an anagram. But it has never been treated as a complex anagram. It has always been treated as the simple anagram of E.S. Andrews spelled backwards until now. If Andrews is an anagram, what else could those letters spell? Three of the five names derived from the anagram do not fit what Erdenes tells us are his initials. This leaves us with two. A shift is a secret action with cards, moving the top block of cards to the bottom. If we move or shift the S in SWE to the bottom, we get the initials WES, which are exactly the initials of one of the remaining two names contained in the anagram. So in his own words, S.W. Erdnase tells us his name, his real name, through the use of artifice, ruse, and subterfuge. The true name of the expert at the card table is W.E. Sanders. And he unscrambled it as a W.E. Sanders, so he had a name, and he began to see if is there a W.E. Sanders who fits the profile we've developed from reading the book. And he found one. It was a, a senator's son and the nephew of, a, a, of a, the first governor of, of Montana, so quite high society in Montana, who turned out to be a mining engineer, had the right age, the right... Uh, he fit the profile that, that was developing at that time. And there he is. And you will note the light hair and the sharp features. Starting with just his name, the more I researched, the more I learned about our candidate, the more he fit the profile. Exactly. Our candidate had edited a book of his and other writers' previously published articles called Mind Timbering, published in 1907. It remains one of the standard references of its type today, and the man's full name was Wilbur Edgerton Sanders. And he was a mining engineer an Erdenes, if you will, forgive, an Earth knows. And, you, and when Richard, when at the LA conference on magic history, when there were two panelists, David Alexander presenting his, I have found Erdenes, it's a complex anagram, you know, Earth knows, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And he says, it's a, a complex anagram because I did an exhausted search and I, there is no E.S. Andrews, therefore, complex. Richard Hatch gets up. I said, well, you know, I found three guys named E.S. Andrews, and a couple of them are in the Chicago area, right?
I think there are lots of E.S. Andrews out there. Now, if you accept his argument that we're not looking for an E.S. Andrews, that we're doing this other anagram thing, that's fine. But I, I have found any number of E.S. Andrews that fit the dates. The problem is finding out things about them. Anyone looking at other uh, authors whose initials don't reverse to E.S. Andrews, I think have jumped the gun. They've gotten ahead of uh, themselves a little bit. We still have plenty of E.S. Andrews candidates to dig into and research. I, I can't follow his logic that, that well, so I don't put much faith in his conclusions, but he definitely, his main thing was just getting the ball rolling again. I think, you know, without him, there might not have been that, as much progress. And I think David Alexander's theory, although I knew David and liked David and respected David as uh, not only as a magician, but also as a skeptic in the skeptic world and as a detective and as a researcher, I, I held David in high regard, but I thought his Erdnays ideas were just nutty, just bug nutty. So my thoughts on David Alexander's candidate, <clears throat> which is Wilbur Edgerton Sanders, are this. And of course, my friend Marty Demarest has taken David's original research and expounded on it uh, many times over. But my thoughts are this. If this book was written by W.E. Sanders, then that theory of David's is the single greatest piece of detective work in the history of detective work. And David Alexander is an absolute genius for seeing through all of this stuff and coming up with Wilbur Edgerton Sanders. The other option is it's the wrong guy. So, you know, it just shows you the, the lengths some, we can be driven to to find a solution. David Alexander's guy seemed pretty like, what kind of algorithm is this guy using? I'll never do, figure it out. And, uh, so talking with Richard Hatch about his, I was like, that sounds like the best guy. But Richard will tell you, you know, uh, he's not 100% convinced, but uh, so many of the puzzle pieces fit really nice. I like the Sanders candidate, and, and I will, cannot dismiss his candidate. It's a fascinating candidate who could well be the guy. I have a personal favorite, which is my Edwin Sumner Andrews, the train agent. He has an interesting job. He's in all the right places at the right time. He appears to be the right height from the one photo we have on him. He's a great circumstantial candidate. We can now put a deck of cards in his hand, kind of. There's an article in San Francisco Call mentioning how he got out of a, a card game. That implies that sometimes he got into them. If there was no such person as an E.S. Andrews, I might start to look in other places for a, a potential author. But we have E.S. Andrews people, we have people with those names, from the time period. So my line of thinking is, until you have excluded every E.S. Andrews between the ages of, say, 30 and 55 or 30 and 60 from that time period, until you've excluded them all, we have no business looking at other people's names. Not yet. We're just not there yet. We knew who Ernest was, and we knew who he was in the 1920s. And the 1920s, uh, we found out that he was really E.S. Andrews, period, full stop, nobody else, it's a guy named E.S. Andrews. Uh, I think we knew it was E.S. Andrews, we didn't know which E.S. Andrews, we can't guarantee we know which E.S. Andrew it is now, even though I think it's Richard Hatch's guy, Edwin Sumner's Andrews, uh, for a variety of reasons. But if I had to bet on it, if I had to put my money on one of the possible candidates, it's Richard Hatch's candidate. He certainly was in the right places at the right time. He's got the right name. Everything seems to work. When Richard Hatch presented his uh, candidate, I was like, that sounds really uh, nice. You know, it's got the right name even, you know, which was one thing that was extra bothersome with the Milton Franklin Andrews. Now, why did he write this book? He said, well, he did it because he, he needed the money. And, but he didn't really say that. I mean, you can interpret it as almost an ironic statement, right? But he also says, uh, but if the book sells, it will accomplish the primary motive because he needs the money. So what happens if the book doesn't sell? So what does he do? Well, he's a gambler. I mean, he's, he's an astute gambler. So he's all in, he lost, go, remainder of the book, go on to something else. Nobody's interested in the book. Uh, I think he needed the money because I think it's Richard Hatch's candidate. 
of, of Edwin Summers. And Summers needed the money, I believe, because he's lost his wife at an early age. He's got two younger kids. He's a traveling railroad guy, and he's got his parents, one who was a Civil War vet who was disabled, who he has to also look after. And I think he's looking after all these things, and I bet you in the time period uh, when he lost his wife and started writing this book and then eventually remarries and has these kids, I would say in, in any economic circumstance, you could use the money. And so when the book does not sell and he gets transferred in his job uh, to, to the West, and he has to remainder these things out. He's cutting bait. You know, he's saying to Drake, you know what? You can have all my existing copies. No, I don't care about a royalty. It's not selling. Pay me for this. I'm on my way. He's cashed his chips. He's out. He died in 1928, which we like people that die before 1930 because the book's copyright was not renewed. And we need an explanation for that. Now, one explanation is a lot of books weren't renewed in their copyright. But in this case, I think it is significant because the book was been in print, had been in print, was a relative bestseller in its little niche market and stayed in print for many years if it was a if it was intellectual property of value, you wouldn't let it become public domain. But if you die before that happens, that and the family didn't know or wasn't interested. He thought he could probably, you know, make some money, and because uh, there were these other books out there, and the quality of them were really poor, so his would actually be good. And uh, the problem is, it didn't really take off, so he folded and and left. And that there's all these editions. He said he did it because he needed the money. A lot of other people have made a hell of a lot more money off his name than he ever did. The number of products today with the name Erdnase on it and imitating that green cover, <laughs> just astonishing, absolutely astonishing. I think for people outside of the sleight of hand magic world, obviously the mystery of the author is the romantic, attractive idea of who this person is. A lot of people, you know, the book is just a kind of cool story that they gravitate to and they own a copy and it's part of what they love about card magic. So if we find out who it is, we find out who wrote this book, I don't think it'll still be so interesting in a hundred years. So it's part of the reason I hope we never find the author. I'm not really sure what the next hundred years holds for this book because I'm not really sure what the next hundred years holds for a deck of playing cards. At some point, in the last 15 years, in a sense, these things became unnecessary. You can play every card game ever invented without a deck of cards these days, whether it's online, whether it's on our smartphones, you know, whether it's on our tablets or, or laptops. You don't need the deck of cards to play card games anymore. And while I don't think they're going to vanish completely anytime soon, in the casino industry, you can already see the shift away from live dealers and live card games. Um, not knowing who wrote it, I, I don't think, well, there's two ways. I, not knowing who wrote it, I don't think is relevant if someone's going to buy this book for the first time. They don't care. I could tell them that it's a cool mystery that we don't, I don't think the average person that wants to learn this, uh, to learn that, uh, to buy the book is buying it. They want to buy it for the secrets that are in it and to learn something new. Later on, when they read more about it, I think that's when it gets interesting to, I want, I want more from S e, uh, S.W. Ordinaries. What else do you have from him? Well, I don't have anything, because I don't even know if that's the guy. Then it gets interesting. I don't want to know who wrote X Ray at the card table. I think that Erdnais gave us a gift. And in the magic world, the more you learn, the less secrets there are for you. I don't know, and I don't think I want to know who wrote the book. It's a very cool mystery. Um, there's not enough mysteries in magic because it's so easy to Google and to YouTube and to figure out who did it. And there is no definitive answer, I don't think. And I think it's interesting. It's a fun mystery of that. Um, you know, E.S. Andrews or S.W. Ordinaires, I don't know, but I don't want to know. I don't think anybody really knows. Names are thrown out and theories are made. But I think when it comes down to it, we're all just guessing. I sometimes think it would be nice to find him. I mostly think it would be much better not to. We've always talked about how can we tell people this story without a conclusion. And for me, I hope I live to a ripe old age and we never find out. And the reason I think that is because the mystery is part of what's kept the book alive. I like the mystery and often the mystery is better. Now the mystery of the authorship really adds an allure to the book. But I don't think it, you know, it just makes it fun 
for me because other people are doing so much research into it, you know, and some people wouldn't do that much research into the book if there wasn't the mystery. So I'm going to miss if the mystery ever leaves. But then you're going to have guys looking up who he is, and that's pretty fun too. So uh, I I'm, I hope they figure it out. I would... I want an 8x10 signed photo, you know, on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm open to the notion we may yet find him. I wouldn't bet a buck we ever will. I've seen that time and time again. A magician learns something and they learn a secret or something. They're like, oh, that's it? It's just that? No. And then they don't care anymore. They don't like it anymore. But Erdnace left us a, a gift. <laughs> In 1905, Hugh Johnston was a young card manipulator, stage performer, and he was performing at the Empress Theater in Denver, Colorado. And after his performance, he said that a, a friend of his named Della Delphia came backstage to say hello. And, in the, and when he arrived backstage with him was a friend of Dell's. And Dell said, Hugh, I want you to meet a friend of mine. This is Erdnace. So, Hugh Johnston, of course, had heard of the book. If this took place in 1905, the book had been out for three years. And as a card manipulator, he certainly would have heard about it. So Hugh Johnston says he met Erdnace in Denver at the Empress Theater in 1905. And this is the story that he told Jay Marshall, and Jay passed it on decades later. And that's pretty much all we know today. An interesting story that... Uh, that at least Hugh Johnston and Delladelphia both at least met or knew or were friends with the guy that wrote this book. So I don't know much about Hugh Johnston, but I did do quite a bit of research into Delladelphia, the cowboy magician. He's a very interesting guy. He did a stage act specialized in doing the vanishing birdcage and the egg bag. And uh, so that's why I was interested in this guy. And the thought that he may have been actually friends with Erdnace was very interesting. Now, he wasn't a close-up card magician. He was a stage performer. And he came from Seattle, Washington. He lived there for many years. Well, I knew an old guy from Seattle, Washington, a great guy named Sid Brockman, who was a dealer. And when Sid passed away a long time ago, I acquired a chunk of Sid's collection. And one of the things that I got was a first edition of the expert at the card table, which I was happy to have. But the thing that made this so interesting was that inside, written was the name of the previous owner, Adelphia. This was Deladelphia's copy. Now, I don't think Deladelphia would have gone out and bought this book because frankly, that was not his interest. But if a good friend of his just wrote a book and said, hey, Del, this is, this is my book, I'd like you to have a copy as a gift. He would have been happy to have that and would very likely have written his name in it in case someone borrowed it or he'd always know which one was his. So I thought, well, this, this makes that story sound real to me, very believable. That story has some huge problems. In 1905, Hugh Johnston was 12 years old. He was not working in vaudeville. He was not a professional stage card manipulator. And in 1905, uh, there was no Empress Theater in Denver, which at this point you think, you know what? This story has been completely blown out of the tub. Uh, it can't be true. Well, it, if all of those were absolute facts, that would be true. This can't, this can't have happened. <clears throat> but 
I mean, we we know that people misremember things, you know, from one day to the next, let alone 40 years later. So if this story had been misremembered only slightly, if it wasn't 1905, if it was 1911, well, Hugh Johnston would have been 18 years old. He could have easily been a vaudevillian. Many young guys were already working in the theater. And in 1911, the Sullivan and Considine vaudeville uh, circuit owned the Majestic Theater in Denver, Colorado. And in 1911, they renamed it the Empress Theater. So if they just made one simple mistake, really, it was as late as that? Okay, 1911. Now everything kind of, it, if not falls into place, becomes possible. Uh, he could have been performing there. It would have been called the Empress Theater. So I like to think that uh, that my pal Deladelphia, the cowboy magician, really did know Erdnace, really did introduce him to Hugh Johnston, and uh, and that he might have that Erdnace might have handed this book to his friend Deladelphia, and Del wrote his name in it.